Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Lazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we will help you to understand how to be the best by on designing your products, on designing your medical device. And I have with me John Spear. So the one that don't know John Spear. So John Spear is the VP and the founder of uh, Greenlight Guru. Uh, so he's a person that I'm following since a long time, even before I started Easy Medical Device. So I'm really honored to have uh, uh, John here. So John, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Monir, it's a pleasure. You do fantastic work and I'm like, uh, finally get to be on your show. So thank you for the opportunity. Great. So for people that don't know, so uh, John has, uh, so Greenlight Guru is a company that is uh, uh, doing a lot of things in terms of medical devices, providing also a lot of uh, resources. He has also a podcast, uh, the Global Medical Device Podcast that I was following, as I've said before, and uh, it's not, uh, it's something that I'm really, uh, I'm really happy. So after following you, having you on my show is like an honor. So it's really great. <laughs> Thanks, and uh, and yeah, so I, I really hope that, yeah, we can, we can really educate people here on, on in terms of design, how they can be better at designing their medical device. But before, the, before that, maybe as I've said, I know you well, but maybe in the audience, people don't know you. So can sure. you just make a small introduction maybe of you and also Greenlight Guru? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, 20, over 22 year med device veteran. I've, I've been in the industry since the late nineties. Uh, I guess the time that I entered in the industry, the regulations were kind of new at that time. So, you know, we were all learning how to figure out those things together, but you know, really have been blessed to be, uh, have a lot of opportunities in the medical device industry from designing and developing new products to helping implement quality systems to helping with regulatory strategy and submissions, worked for large companies. I've worked for startup companies. I've started my own consulting practice and, you know, eventually started Greenlight Guru, which, you know, was sort of uh, out of necessity, you know, as a start working with a lot of startups and, and, and in my own consulting practice, we constantly struggled with managing design control activities, specific, specifically traceability. And, and I knew there had to be a better way. And that's what led me to start Greenlight Guru and, and to build the platform. And it's evolved you know, quite a bit from those early days to what it is today. And, and I'm pretty proud of that. And, and I know we have an amazing team that's doing amazing things. But, you know, the, the outside of the, the med device world, uh, I, uh, I have two adult children uh, and you know, that happened way faster than I imagined. You can probably <laughs> see in the background. I, I like to play guitar. I uh, spend time with um, my, my fiance, Amanda. We, ha we have a good time uh, finding a good place to drink craft beer, or maybe some bourbon or something like that. So anyway, it's a little bit about me and a little bit about green light. No, I think it's great. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's it's really um, great to have you here because, uh, as I've said, I, I was listening to a lot of your uh, of your podcast episode, and what came out each time is the fact that you are really uh, a fan of design, of development, of all what is quality uh, management related to that. So I said, okay, um, maybe we can have you on the on the show here, helping us to understand all this about designing yeah. a medical device, how how to be best at doing that, and not fall on some myths or or, um, or some issues that can uh, that can that people can can for, yeah find if I can say on their way. Um, okay, so may maybe to start on this, so um, we have if I can say in terms of design development, we have some um, thinking that there is one methodology only that we can use, and we know that also as as I say as I'm following you, there is the waterfall method, which is the one that uh, looks like a waterfall. If I can say, we can make the image for those that are looking at uh, on on the video on the on the YouTube channel, uh, and you have the agile method. So, can you, if I can say, make a, a short, really short description of what are those for people that really don't understand those kind of methodology? Yeah, sure. So I guess high level wa waterfall is typically, I think there's a few synonyms with waterfall, like stage gate or phase gate. Sometimes those are, are ways or terms that are also similar, but basically it's going, doing one step before you do the next step. And in between those steps, you have uh, a purposeful, meaningful uh, review, oftentimes from a, not just from a uh, technical perspective, but oftentimes from a business perspective, a gate that uh, authorizes you to move to the next stage. And, you know, depending on the size of your company, that may be more formal than, than others, but, but essentially a waterfall is I move from here to here to here to here in a sequential pattern. Whereas um, 
typically agile is a little bit more, uh, there's more parallelism uh, in the process where I may be doing multiple things from multiple phases sort of concurrently. And I, and I think that's another term that's synonymous with agile is concurrent engineering or doing things at the same time. So again, that's super high level, but hopefully that gives a little bit of context to people. No, I think, I think it's, it's clear. So uh, yeah, we are used to have those kind of gates. I mean, I worked in the corporate industry, so we have we are used to have gate one, gate two. So as soon as we finalize gate two, so we don't come back, if I can say it's more like you have to move forward only. Right. And, uh, and yeah, so this is something that uh, the agile, if I can say methodology that uh, arrived was really revolutionizing if i can say the industry yeah. saying <laughs> now you have another way to do it it's like because before yeah. companies were saying okay i see that fda for example only had this waterfall model so there is nothing else we can do but here yeah you have also other uh, some something that you have you can think also well but i, th I think that's the myth and and thank you uh, for not being too annoyed as I get some coffee. Folks, so everything I've said so far is pre-coffee. That's about to change. So, <laughs> um, but, but I do think, Munir, I think that is a myth about FDA. I think there is a perception that the, because in the, the um, FDA design control guidance, they, they have that infamous uh, uh, waterfall diagram. Now, uh, it's my understanding that actually that diagram came from Health Canada, but if you just stopped at the picture and, and didn't read the guidance, you might be led to believe that FDA wants you to have a waterfall approach to your medical device design and development. That is just not true. Um, if, the, if you read on, FDA talks about the importance of uh, iteration and concurrent engineering and, and you know, keep in mind this guidance was written in 1996, I think. It predates the term agile development uh, that wasn't fashioned and, or coined as a term until many years later. But FDA talks about concurrent engineering. And I, I, what I want people to, to take home, and waterfall is a perfectly acceptable approach. Don't mishear me. Uh, agile is too. My preference, I think, if, if you know, I got to help set up product development processes, the, com the right combination of both, let's blend those things. But um, but you can be completely agile and, and still be in good shape from an FDA perspective. The key or the caveat is to make sure that you're addressing those core elements from a design control perspective. And that's what that image is attempting to do is show the relationship of different design control elements to one another, not necessarily describe your process, your product development process or methodology. No, I think it's it's clear here. And um, the thing here is the fact that um, what happened to the US also arrived to Europe. Uh, so many also European companies, even if they are following ISO 13485, are saying, okay, we have to go through this Gates uh, Gates process. Uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's something that, as you mentioned, so there is a, if you read carefully, you can go in another way. So it's just a method that is that is used. But what I will hear also a lot is the fact that. Uh, an agile method is more for software. So is this also something that you, you think that, that this is really more adapted for software? Well, I mean, I, I believe um, if I remember the origin of, of the agile manifesto, I, I believe that um, was a result of software development. Now don't quote me to that, but um, okay. I, I, I think it is the methodology as, as, as we know uh, of Agile today, I think did come from, or has its origins from software. Um, and, and I think it certainly is applicable to software, but I don't think it has to be, has to be limited to software. Um, I just go back to my career and, and even early days and um, working on 100% mechanical devices, no electronics, no software, just catheter, plastic components, materials, tubing, 100% mechanical. And I, I didn't call it this then, but but I looking back, I would definitely say we we approached it with an agile methodology as well. You know, we do iterative prototyping, but we will be working on you know future things like writing our verification test protocols um, while we were still in design. You know, trying to because we had tight timelines. You know, usually when I started a project, I was given the due date before I even started the project. And so now the only thing you can do in some cases to, to try to hit those aggressive targets is bring in some parallelism or some agile type methodology or concurrent engineering. 
Um, but no, I think it's, it's, or yes, I think agile works for, for things well beyond software for sure. Okay. I think it's, it's good because, uh, yeah, I think this is one of the myths that everybody is to- talking about. So do you have other myths about Agile and Swatterfall? Maybe something that you hear yourself and you think, okay, let's, let's, let's explain that. No, it's not true. Or <clears throat> Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, and, and on the software side, I think one of the, the fastest growing segments in our industry today is software as a medical device. Okay. And what I hear a lot from, from these companies well, usually not always, but oftentimes the software as a med device company, they're, they're software development minded first. Okay. And uh, they only are, seem to be medical device minded or think about the regulations because they have to, right? Not because it's, that's necessarily how they're, they're wired or ble- – and and, but the problem is that the myth about waterfall and agile that we just talked about, that's so pervasive throughout our industry – that the software developer, what they hear is med device is restrictive and prevents them from being software developers. Um, so, so this is a common myth. And, and I, a lot of times, unfortunately, I see a lot of software as a med device companies, they almost, they understand they have to, to figure out how to, to comply with the regulations so that they can get their software uh, device to the market. But they they were just they do it kicking and screaming. I mean, they just reject the whole notion of it. Okay. You know, they feel like they're being constrained the whole time. And and I'm I'm just here to tell you that you know if you there is a way that you can be a software developer just like you you have always been. The only thing that that regulations are really expecting or or are asking of you if your product happens to be a med device is document what decisions you're making and why you're making those decisions. That's really what design controls is all about and demonstrate that the thing works the way that you said it was going to do. But if I'm a software developer, I probably want to do that anyway. Right. So I don't think this is a, you know, earth shattering for the software developer, but I, but I do think there's a, there's a little bit of friction for software as a med device when it comes to being regulated. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, some people are contacting uh, me uh, that are from software and and they first develop the, the software and then they contact us and then they say, okay, w- what can we do to, to make it a software as a medical device? And so, okay, have you followed this standard? Have you followed this thing? Have you... I said, no, we don't know what it is. So, okay, so maybe we have to redo some work with you then because there well, is things that, uh, that, that yeah, you have to follow also, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like a, a good example is the IEC 62304 standard. Yeah. That's a terrific standard. And, and I think sometimes when people read that, um, they, take, they take it as a prescription. Like, you know, these are all the things that I, uh, I absolutely must do. I mean, you could take that interpretation, I suppose. But if you, and, and the other thing that I think sometimes people get confused about with 62304 is they're like, oh, well, that's like the opposite of what FDA or what a regulatory body. No, actually, they're saying the same thing. They're just... They have different uh, different perspectives or different points of view about, but they're talking about the same topic. Okay, yeah, they use slightly different terminology. Uh, you know, user needs versus or SRS and SDS versus you know inputs and outputs. But if if you interpret those things, they mean the same thing. It's just a slightly different. It, it, it's a lexicon thing. It's a terminology thing. But they're saying the same thing. They they're portraying the same intent and the same message yeah i agree with you it's just a question of vocabulary and maybe a, a mindset and understanding exactly how it's working but we are all going on the same direction so mainly right. uh, trying to deliver a product that is working safe and performant for for the for the users um in terms of um of this so waterfall and agile so for me when i hear that it's more like a project uh, tool so we are using that during a project for designing everything so is it correct so can we use that to say this is my methodology that I'm following during the project and I have a project leader plus engineers working on that. So is this the, the, also the mindset here? Yeah, I think that's um, spot on, Manir. I'd, um, pick the tool. It is a tool. It is a, an approach. I mean, really what you're trying to do, regardless of, of the whether it's Agile, uh, Waterfall, or some other thing or a blend or whatever the case may be, all you're trying to, to do, at least – my understanding of this or my interpretation is define your business practice 
around your activity around product development, because, you know, in some respects, there is a goal, there is an objective that you're trying to achieve with that product development. It's not to be perpetually in doing research and developing something. At some point, you want to get the product to uh, an animal study or a clinical study or to market. Um, so there has to be some sort of uh, approach to to lead you along. And and that's all that, that this is intended to do is give you a business practice that's documented that you know, can, you can communicate to your state, your project team, your stakeholders, uh, so that you have some idea of when you're going to be at certain milestones within your project. Yeah. And, um, one, one maybe question or, or, or thing that can be a bit tricky here is about, um, what comes first? Is it the project leader that will be managing the project or the methodology that you have to choose? So, If I start a project, should I already say, no, I, anyway, my company is going through waterfall. So you are coming on the project. So you follow waterfall or because we are talking about this product and this timeline and this thing, then we can pick a waterfall or what, uh, or agile methodology. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, I, I think in, in kind of, there's a couple of factors. One factor is, is, are you a startup? And this is your very first project. Um, If, if that's the state that you're in, then I wouldn't get too hung up on whether or not you have a procedure in place um, before you start the development. Um, I think it's important if you're in that situation, though, to, to educate and inform yourself. Uh, you know, maybe you're brand new to this, but do go read, you know, the EUMDR. Uh, it's pretty thorough with respect to <clears throat> design and development. Go, go read ISO 49, or I'm sorry, 1345. Yeah, 14971 probably too, but 1345. Uh, read the FDA um, QSR, uh, read the FDA guides document, uh, read through 62304 and all these different standards. It's a lot of information, but, but what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is educate yourself enough so that you know what you should be documenting at that particular point in your project. Um, that's why I think the waterfall diagram, uh, the, the picture from FDA guidance document is really good because it gives you a very, a very easy to understand picture of what should be documented uh, and how it connects to the next thing that's going to happen. Um, so just even if you don't have a procedure, focus on, on what you need to be doing at that point in time and just keep good, good records of that um i, I think i think it, it's good because uh yeah I, i mean at the end as we said these are tools so it's not like uh, a philosophy so if i can say so you have really to i mean you have a, a screw if i can say to put on the wall so uh should you use a hammer or should you use a, a screwdriver then you choose that because of this uh, screw so uh, if it's a nail it's a different etc so the idea here is really to use the tool that is really adapted to your to your philosophy or methodology instead of just using a tool because it is here and you have no other choice which maybe can can go to the wrong direction yeah and i think it's important like like don't get like sort of um caught in a in a in a, in a circle uh, trying to figure this out <clears throat> take action some action is better than no action um again if if it's a choice between uh i'm going to write a procedure versus work on my, my product to advance it uh, to a little bit further toward a little bit closer to, to market. Just, I'm going to pick work on the project, work on the product all day, you know, again, yeah. I'm going to, but I'm going to bring good design practices and principles and, and I'm going to have good documentation and record keeping through it. So even if, if, you know, you don't know how to write procedures, that's okay. Those are, you know, there are people who know how to do that and that's easy for those people it may be really hard for you. Your skill may be being a developer. Well, focus on that. Just, you know, keep a good archive of what you're doing so that somebody else coming in at, at some point in time can, can understand where that is. Now there's points in time where, you know, if, if you're about to, to do a regulatory submission or uh, before you go to a clinical trial, <clears throat> um, I, I would change my answer. I, I think at that point you need to be Those are key milestones, that data and information that, that you're gathering from those specific types of events 
are going to help support your your tech file, your CE Mark tech file, or your 510K or whatever regulatory submission or pathway you're going to. So at, at some point, you need to be more formal from a procedural standpoint. But early days, you, you know, it's not like the Wild West uh, here in the U.S., but, uh, um, but, you know, have a little bit of discipline, but don't get too hung up on it. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right. Mainly, mainly, uh, it's what also I'm saying to uh, to startups that are starting. Don't focus specifically on procedures. I mean, at the end, you have the what what, what we always say on procedures is that uh, is the fact that when you create a procedure, it says uh, write what you do and then do what you write. So mainly, first you have to yeah. do and then you write it later on the procedure, uh, which is really the right methodology. Quick break. Okay, let me show you what is Easy Medical Expert. This is a platform that puts in contact companies, consultants, and where you can submit some tasks there. So let me show you how this is working. If you are offering a mission, then you register on the platform as a company. What you are doing then is that you can publish your missions. How to do that? You go on the plus at the top, you open the new window, you put a task title, you put a category, you can put if you want a budget and a due date, and then you put all the details about your mission and you post it. What happened next is that you can receive maybe some applications, you can receive some public comments, and you have to answer to them or to contact those people so you can clarify maybe the mission. If you are happy with them, you can rate them with some stars. And if you are looking for a mission, then you can go to the platform and register as a consultant, and then you can see the missions and you can ask your question and apply to them. Okay, so here is what is Easy Medical Expert. Register at easymedicalexpert.com. Um, in terms of development, so here we talk more about tools, etc. So when we start the development of a project or, or for, for, for the product, so uh, what are the most important parts you think, I mean, if you had really to say this part of the project or of the development is really key for you, so what would it be? Well, I, I, th I think number one is, is the, um, are the requirements uh, of your project. Um, and, and requirements can have, can be called a lot of different things. Um, you know, from FDA perspective, it, it will refer to those things as design inputs. You know, and I, I would even um, kind of bundle in user needs as well, maybe into that bucket. Um, 1345 is going to call it design and development inputs or design and development input requires. Or anyway, the, the terminology, again, you know, sometimes we have a, a, a semantics issue, um, but requirements, same thing as design inputs. Basically, it's what you are, what, how you describe what your product needs to do. Uh, and usually it's, you know, it's a list of things. Usually it's, it's um, t typically pretty technical, not, not always, but generally pretty technical. Oftentimes the, the engineering uh, resources are pretty heavily involved in that. But I, I think that's the most important part because to me requirements are, um, are kind of like the contracts for your product. They describe, you know, all the clauses, all the, the thou shouts and all those sorts of things. Uh, and it becomes a, a, a means by which you can communicate to other stakeholders, you know, uh, within your business, whether that be manufacturing or quality or regulatory and that sort of thing. So requirements are the most important. And, and, and I think a lot of times though, that people, um, they don't, they know it's important, but they don't, they're they're trying to rush to get through it and and i think the other thing is this is where agile and waterfall um can be problematic you know if, if you're too purist on the the waterfall approach you'll want to have a list of requirements that is complete and i think that forces bad behavior it is okay for you to not know everything about your requirements in order to proceed uh, it's okay to put things like to be determined or to flag something to say, hey, I don't know uh, what, how, I know we need something around this, this specific area, but I don't know what the, the specific details are for this particular requirement. I need to go build a prototype so that I can do some, you know, benchtop testing or some sort of investigation to learn more about this. So I'm going to put a placeholder here that says I need to find out later. And that shouldn't slow down 
everything else that you're doing in your project just because you have some unresolved items. Now you need to resolve them at some point in time, but the design in, input requirements, it's a very fluid thing. Okay, so related to, to that, so mainly when we talk about also agile and, and waterfall here in terms of development, um, the reason I think that is clear apparently is the fact that with waterfall, it's like start to be a bit more perfect before you go to the next step means that having yeah. a lot of details and then you can go to the next step and waterfall it's like okay i know a bit let's move forward uh, then i will know maybe more in the way so i will then have to update and change things etc so it's more like agile if i can say so is, is it also the consequence of that is also the fact that with agile we can go quicker and with waterfall we can go slower is it correct or not well i think that is the perception um and I, I've, I've worked on waterfall projects that comparable to an agile that, that went faster than an agile. I, I, it's, I think that's the speed is less, that is the, the mindset of why I choose one method over the other. Um, but it's really about the execution um, that's going to dictate my, my rate, uh, my, my speed at which I can go through things. It's really about my, my discipline um, and that sort of thing. So, you know, I don't think that's, I don't think one is necessarily faster than the other. Uh, I think it's about being deliberate, you know, but the, but where I see projects fall down all the time, uh, both agile and both waterfall is when they don't spend enough time on their requirements. Okay. Um, so they, they may be, they may think that they know enough or, or have moved on to, to downstream activities and they get into like the the VMV uh, activities, the the testing uh, of the product, and they realize, oh crap, uh, we don't know how to test this because that requirement is uh, that was for this particular thing is I don't understand it or it's ambiguous or it's vague there is, or there is no ISO standard. Also, there is no kind of validation yeah. methodology that it's new. Like when we have some new developments also, uh, the, the problem is how, that, that some companies are feeling to be blocked because they say, how do I test that to prove to the regulators that I'm, I'm okay. I, I'm looking for ISO standards, all the list. I'm trying to find which one can be fitting there and there is nothing. So what should I do here? So mainly, yeah, yeah. It's, it can be also a, a something but you, like that. You don't but you don't find that out for, for quite some time. I mean, you've moved past the requirements many months ago and now you're, you know, you, everybody's happy and then you get into verification and, and, you know, maybe there's a different group. Maybe you have a, a test engineer or a quality engineer uh, if you're part of a larger team and their, their job is to interpret how to, how to demonstrate, you know, with objective evidence, these things. But if the requirements were, were not thoughtfully written um with a mind towards how you're going to prove and demonstrate it from a, from a verification and validation perspective, that's going to slow things down. So, but, but I've, like I said, I've seen agile projects uh, do that. I've seen waterfall projects do that where they, they got through the requirements without enough detail and information and they moved on. And, and that's what causes more, most delays. So uh, in terms of, uh, you, you talked a lot about also verification validation. So um, I know that a lot of people are asking um, us, so what is the difference here? What, what, what is a verification? What is a validation? So how can I compare that? Which one is first? Which one is second? Um, what is, yeah, how, how can we describe that to them? Yeah, um, so, because a, a lot of times people will, will sort of bundle these things together. VMV, I did it just a moment ago and, and describing a few things um and i think they get bundled together because uh a lot of time well there's lots of nuances but i guess first let's start with the definition so de design verification is really about uh demonstrating that you've designed your product correctly and the mechanics of design verification is demonstrating that your design outputs uh and i I think the word design outputs confuses people. So I, I usually refer to design output as it's your list of specifications and materials and manufacturing instructions and, and software code and things of that nature. Um, the other uh, metaphor that I use is uh, design outputs is like the recipe for your medical device. It describes okay. the ingredients, what order to put them in, how long to, to bake them, et cetera, et cetera. 
So, but design verification is demonstrating that your design outputs meet your design inputs. Again, it's about designing, did you design the product correctly? Whereas design validation is, did you design the correct product? Okay. Now, it, the distinction is subtle, but design the correct product takes me back to those user needs. And did I understand the intended use? Did I understand the use cases? Did I understand the, the user, the clinician, the patient? And at the end, I'm, I'm demonstrating that I've designed the correct product. So that's the distinction, but it gets, sometimes it can get blurry um, when you're actually in VMV. Uh, there are things that I may do from a design verification standpoint that may also satisfy design validation. And again, that's, that's super nuanced and, and very vague and ambiguous, but hopefully it gives a little bit of context of, of what the difference between verification and validation is. I, I like the one that you use about the recipe because many saying that, yeah, the design verification is like you have followed the recipe and you have followed all the things. For me, design validation then would be the tasting test to verify that what you cooked yeah. at the end is really meeting the user uh, yeah. needs. So many, it, it would be really that. So if you followed really the recipe and then if you, if the user really uh, like what they are eating at the end, if, if it was what, yeah. what they are, were expecting. That's a good way to think about it. I appreciate you taking that metaphor a step <laughs> or two further, but yeah, it's great. Um, okay, so um, okay, so I, I think yeah, we had really here a great understanding of the design part of how it is uh, working. So. Um, as a last uh, question, so do you have, I mean, as you were working on la a lot on design, helping maybe some companies about that. So uh, do you have some some best practices, something that people um, would maybe hear from you and you say, okay, you have to do, because each time companies are doing this mistake or each time companies are falling on this trap, etc. Mm -hmm. do you have some tips to say, okay, do this first or do that or be careful of this, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, there's a couple of things that come to mind. And, and the first that comes to mind is actually what, what um, sparked me to the, the initial idea for Greenlight. And the, and the first tip is have a traceability matrix and, and start that from, from the beginning of your project. Um, I'll tell a short story, if that's okay, about why I think that's important. Yeah. So uh, my short story, I go, this takes me back to, I was probably... Let's go with 23, 24-ish. Uh, I've been at my job for about a year, year and a half, give or take. And I was working on my first project that was going to be submitted to via 510K to FDA. So as a young engineer, uh, this is, I'm excited. Uh, and I want it to be, like, we're a week out from this 510K submission going in. So we've already had lots of designer views. There's, you know, and, it is, and these days we didn't put anything on a computer. We actually had stacks of paper and binders and all that sort of thing. I had a file cabinet next to my desk that had all my project files in it. Um, but anyway, I, um, I had this, I wanted things to be perfect. So I decided, you know, I'm going to, to you know, cross check everything. And so I opened Excel and I created all these columns and I had all my documents and I was able to, you know, start to populate, um, you know, and basically build a traceability matrix to show, oh, this user need led to this design input. Here are the outputs. This is the verification we did. Here's the value, you know, all these sorts of things. And in doing so, um, it was a wonderful ex exercise. And I remember like, I was so proud of it. I, I was telling people, some of the, the more um, the, the more senior engineers, like, look at this. And they're like, oh, wow, that's so cute. They patted me on the head. They're like, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> Um, and then they rolled their eyes and moved on. But anyway, um, but anyway, I was proud of it. Um, but then I was terrified as I started to analyze like, oh crap, this thing, this material uh, needs to be biocompatible for circulating blood up to 30 days. Uh, that means that we have to do A, B, C, and D. It's, you know, very prescriptive as to what, you know, thou shalt do. And Biocompatibility is one of those things that is an absolute must to, that you need to address for regulatory submission. And I had done like four of the five uh, items, but I, one of them I, I, I had fallen through the cracks for some reason. So I had this gap, this white space, this missing element. I was like, oh my goodness, we're supposed to submit in a week, um, but we don't have that test. And, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's not going to fly. Uh, so I have to go tell my boss that, the project 
uh, needs to be delayed by six weeks because we have, oh, and I need him to spend, authorize a, a PO to spend another $15,000 for this test. Um, yeah, that, so that was an unpleasant activity, but an important one. For, so from that point on, I built a traceability matrix at the beginning and kept it up to date throughout rather than doing it mid or late stream and trying to connect the dots. So do a traceability matrix, do it from day one. And, and I think if you haven't done that, uh, it would be the agency that would have catched up maybe the issue. And then you would maybe have more than six weeks of delay and maybe more than yeah. 15,000 of, of course, to, to pay all yeah. these uh, things to be done. So it's all something that uh, maybe, yeah, there is an issue in the middle, but it's better to catch it before that it's sent to the, to oh, the agency sure. mainly. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, it, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, you're right. Um, you know, if you said, oh, they may find it, they may not find it. Are you willing to roll the dice and take that gamble? Because to your point, you may not hear anything for several weeks. And when you do hear, you may be, a, the company may be thinking you're a step or two closer to, to market launch only to get some bad news from, from the regulatory body. So No, I think it's good here. Um, okay, so I, I think here we are. We have really covered all the elements that we wanted to discuss about uh, design. Um, so I hope this will be really helping uh, helping all the uh, the audience here. Um, now I want to talk more more about Greenlight Guru. So as I've said to you, so I knew Greenlight Guru because mainly um, I was looking for some resources in terms of quality and regulatory affairs for medical devices, and I find a lot of resources on your website. And then going to that, I say, okay, what? I thought at the beginning Greenlight Guru is just a, like a blog site talking about quality and regulatory affairs. And then I find you are making some software, some uh, EQMS. Um, and from there, you are really developing and you are really improving your software. Now, I, I just heard about the Halo uh, software, which is like a prediction software. So can you talk more about this kind of new uh, the design or development that you have done for, for your company? Sure, I'd love to. So, um, and, it, and it actually at the end of, uh, 2020, um, we rolled out this this uh, feature we call Visualize. <clears throat> so Visualize is sort of, uh, um, think about it in a way that like w you, you could probably all visualize a, a mind map, right? Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I use mind maps all the time to, to sort of organize my thoughts. Well, Visualize is, is sort of like a mind map, but for your quality system. And it shows how things are connected uh, with a picture. Uh, and I, I happen, you know, I'm a visual kind of guy. Um, I, I think a lot of folks are when I can see a picture of how something's connected, that, that helps me better understand the relationship. So visualize was sort of that, that first, uh, thing that we rolled out towards the end of, of 2020, um, to, to give you a picture of your quality management system and how things are connected and halo for change management it takes that a step further. Uh, so um, Halo for Change Management is using machine learning and natural language processing and the algorithms that we developed to go in and sort of interrogate your system behind the scenes, so to speak, so that if you're making a, a change to a document or to a procedure, you know, you may know, oh, you know, this is affected, this is impacted, and, and this one is, but, you know, do you know, did you catch everything? Uh, are you, how do you know? Um, you know, maybe you did a keyword search or that sort of thing. But what Halo for Change Management does is it feeds you rec recommendations and, and things that might be um, applicable to that change that you're making uh, and gives you, you know, a, cu a curated list of information so that you can go through and understand why the, the uh, recommendation engine uh, has done so to, to made that that recommendation. So you can go in and intelligently say, yeah, this applies or no, this doesn't, and here's why. And you know, by you know determining yes, no as, as what what does and doesn't fit from a, a halo you know, for those recommendations, actually fine tunes the algorithm even further so that you know it just makes it you know smarter, so to speak. But halo for change management is just a way to to help you streamline uh, your change management practice and make sure that. It's complete and right and holistic the first time so that you don't have to do a follow-up change a few weeks later and then another one a few weeks later because you missed something. No, I think it's good because uh, it looks like, I mean, we had really a, a big progression here. We, we, we go from 
paper-based system where we mainly had to fill everything on paper. We have to ask to send that on desks to sign for people, etc. And when we have to archive them, they go, if I can say, inside a, a, a downstairs room or a basement or whatever, yeah. uh, to now going to software that are really helping us to create documents and to make them better and to avoid some some mistakes so really this a tool that is helping us so yeah we see really here a lot of progress so is this something that also the regulators are looking at or are they more happy when you arrive to show them like you have an eqms or they are still confident if you have a paper-based system well um that i think I, we're seeing a trend uh that Auditors uh, are not that they expect a qual uh, your quality system to be electronic per se, um, but I do think there are quite a few auditors that that you know an EQMS is not a brand new thing. These these tools have been available for quite some time, so it does beg the question though: if you're a company today uh, and you're still paper based. Um, that's going to raise probably some suspicion with your auditor um, because it's, paper is it doesn't scale. It's not the best way. And, you know, especially in, in, in current times, you know, a lot of us are remote anyway, like how in the world uh, is, is paper? Oh, oh, I scanned it. Oh, great. Did you validate that? What about this? You know, so there's a lot of other challenges with that. Um, so I, I think that I, I don't know. It's, it's not a requirement. It is, uh, but it is, strange and odd if you ha don't have an, an, a, an EQMS solution in place and no, like SharePoint's great and Google Drive's great and Dropbox are great. I, I use those tools all the time. They're not an EQMS, right? Just because you have some folders doesn't, doesn't make that an EQMS. Um, but I do think that the, the, um, the audit experience with ISO auditors and FDA uh, investigators we're seeing that change and evolve in a good way with our customers. The audits are so much more streamlined and, it, and it's, it's smoother, it's easier. Uh, you know, in one case, the audit, um, a, a, day, a day and a half was shaved off the audit because they accomplished everything in such a, a much more efficient manner. And, and I think with things like visualize and halo for change management, these are our features and, and other things that we're, you know, rolling out this year. These are features that are designed and intended to help the medical device company be more efficient, not just, you know, in their day to day, but, you know, with audits and things of that nature, because it is a thing that we have to be prepared for. And how awesome is it to know that when you use Greenlight, you're audit ready all the time. There's no special preparation that you have to do. It's just, it's, it's there. It's ready. All the records, the, the full audit log and, and all those sorts of things. It's all in the system intentionally designed with the medical device industry in mind. No, I think it's, it's great. And, and I really uh, recommend uh, so to have some EQMS uh, to, to uh, work on that because mainly, as you've said, also during this coronavirus period, I think it's great to have a tool that is connecting you with everybody where you can get the, the official documents. As I'm saying, it's an official document because it's on the system instead of a copy that you have maybe on your desk that maybe is already uh, uh, obsolete. So I think it's great. Um, okay, great. So um, the other thing is that, yeah, as, as I've said, you have the two podcasts so Global Medical Device podcast and true quality stories podcast so uh, just quickly so um, for the global medical device podcast so uh, mainly you are doing the same as what I'm doing so you are interviewing some people in terms of educating also so I think it's a, a great tool also that I recommend to listen to educate yourself in terms of some regulation you are doing a lot of uh, the US regulations also which is uh, something that is uh, I appreciate because I don't have so much of those resources so which is great but um, yeah are you are you are you doing the same in terms also of uh, not talking only about the U.S. but talking about all the world regulations? We we are yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would say though that some of our guests you know they're they're uh, uh, super deep uh, and knowledgeable with respect to FDA. But you know we're Greenlight is a global company. Uh, our our customers are in like sixty different countries around the world. Uh, we we want to make sure that we're focusing on not just the U.S. but other markets of interest, and so from our content, you know, you, you'll all, all the time we're talking about one, three, four, eight, five, and yeah. one, 
four nine seven one, and then we talked about six two three zero four. I mean, these are industry standards that that are um, applicable regardless of market. But obviously, EU MDR is right around the corner. Actually, you and I uh, talked about that on the Global Medical Device Podcast yeah. recently uh, as well. So, no, it's important because w- w- one of the things that's happening in this in our world is um, from a philosophical perspective anyway, I think there's a convergence of, of um, regulatory practices and behaviors. Now there's a few nuances and, and you know, some very important distinct differences, but generally speaking, the, the philosophy, the, the mindset is pretty consistent uh, and, and regardless of where you're going to design and develop and manufacture medical devices. Now, again, there are, the devils are in the details for sure, but no. So I think it's important that, you know, we, we try to be global in, in making sure that people are aware of all the different opportunities and options and nuances and, and regulations. No, I think it's great. So, um, yeah, I really recommend listening to your podcast. It's really interesting, and uh, it will be really providing a lot of uh, information. Um, so, where people can follow up with you? So, um, I see, I think the Greenlight Group website, but is there another way that uh, we can contact yeah. you? Sure. I mean, uh, and maybe this is a brave thing to do, but um, I'm, I'm cool with it. Um, if you want to reach out to me directly, you have a question, you can always email me. Um, the easiest way is that's the easiest way. Uh, and, and I read and, and respond to 100% of my emails. Um, best email address would be J S P E E R at greenlight dot guru G U R U. I will mention that on the, on the, on the show notes and also on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no dot coms, no dot net. Yeah, exactly. no dot green yeah, Greenlight dot guru. So it's great. <laughs> and I really like the name also. Um, okay. So I think it's great. So thank you really, uh, John, for um, all this information. I really uh, hope that uh, this will be helping a lot of uh, our audience here in terms of how to design medical devices, uh, which is the best methodology and what is the mindset also to have in terms of that. And uh, for people that are listening, so uh, don't hesitate also to go on the show notes uh, to get all the information. I will place all the links related to uh, all what we talked today and uh, also the information about how maybe to contact uh, John if you have any question. Uh, anyway, you can put your comments also on the YouTube channel or on the podcast uh, page where uh, if there is any question to John, I will send that to him directly. Okay, so John, really thank you for your help. Thank you for all the information that you provided and I wish you a nice day. Thank you, Monir. And Monir, you're doing such a fantastic job with, with this. I, I, I totally appreciate you know the, the quality of guests and, and the style of interviewing. You do a great job, so keep it up. Great, thank you. Thank you very much.